Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Gareth Greenaway joins me. We're going to be talking about an operating system in your browser, Friend. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Gareth Greenaway. Episode 450, recorded September 14th, 2017. Friend. Floss Weekly is brought to you by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price. Because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash floss and entering the promo code FLOSS. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day and totally unaware of it, projects you might want to download right after this show and play with. I bet today is one of the, one of the, one of those. Yes, there we go. They let anybody do this show. Uh, joining me today once again is Gareth Greenwood. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Randall. Glad to be back. Awesome, awesome. And where are you speaking to us from? I'm betting Thousand Oaks by the background. I am, yeah, I am in Thousand Oaks, California. It's a, a rainy day here today. It's rainy up there? It's good. It's sunny down here in L.A., so that's kind of nice. Uh, so I am in uh, the L.A. Live Complex because I've been attending the last three days and now totally exhausted by it. The Open Source Summit used to be called LinuxCon. It's uh, set up by the Linux Foundation. Amazing speakers, amazing uh, attendees uh, chatting with them, uh, getting to bump into old friends and stuff like that. Um, I have, out of this conference, already gotten six new bookings or in the process of bookings for new guests coming up and some very exciting new projects coming up. So uh, I'm very happy that I uh, attended this, but I'm glad it's only four days. Today's the last day, and I get to relax after this again. I don't have to be running around four or five miles every day, as according to my Fitbit, and uh, and trying to chase down where the where the st- you know, Studio 3 is. Where the heck is that? I haven't been there yet. So it's looking around for places in the, in, in the uh, conference hotel is always uh, exciting. And I am on the uh, hotel Wi-Fi, so if you hear a few dropouts occasionally, that's the best we can do. Well, today we have a very interesting and distinct sort of project. We're going to be talking with the creators of Friend. And from what I can understand, Friend is, uh, bring up my notes here. So Friend, in their words, is the operating environment that unifies web applications and gives them an ecosystem to thrive in. And Friend offers a coherent user interface across all devices. And in a nutshell, I've been calling this uh, a desktop OS in a browser. And I think that's probably the easiest place to start with in terms of understanding this. Gareth, uh, what, what do you, what have you, what's your takeaway from this so far? Yeah, so I actually discovered Friend uh, a few months ago, um, and it's it's one of the reasons why I was most excited to, to be to get to be co-host of the show. Um, I follow one of our guests' YouTube channels, um, and he actually announced it, and I uh, was really excited about it. And I kind of looked at it, played around with it, um, and I had the same kind of impression as you did. It's it's a um, it's an operating system, a desktop operating system, based in a browser. Um, at least that was my take on and my impression. Um, of what it was. Okay. Well, in a few minutes, we're going to be bringing on the the two lead, uh, probably BDFLs, uh, <laughs> presuming this carries on for a while, uh, which is looking down quick, Dan Wood and Hogni Tiltstad. Hope I don't get that too badly messed up. I'm sure he'll correct me if I screwed up that. Uh, but before we do that, we have a very important announcement from a very important person, my good friend, Leo Laporte. Go ahead, Leo. Hey, uh, if I might, I'd like to interrupt this edition of Floss Weekly. Great show, by the way. Always enjoy it. With a a word from our sponsor. Randall asked me to do these because he knows I sleep on a Casper mattress, and I love it. You know, Randall, we've got to send you a Casper mattress. You need a Casper. Casper is an online retailer of premium mattresses made in the USA, for a fraction of the price. You know, we had Phil Libin from Evernote on the other day. He said, you know what he loved about Casper is, the ma- <laughs> I didn't really know this. He said, the mattress business is notorious. Kind of like car dealerships, mattress stores are notorious for markup, deceptive practicing, up practices upselling. 
You know, it's it's like a bunch of sharks waiting for you to come into the pool, <laughs> and you end up with a four thousand dollar mattress, and you're not happy. He's, he says, this is why Casper exists, because this was a business that didn't work for customers. Casper will sell you a mattress direct for a fraction of the price. It's a fantastic, obsessively engineered mattress. And I'll tell you a little bit about the mattress, because I sleep on it in a bit. But, but the reason this works is because I think people for years thought, well, I'm not going to buy... It's like shoes. I'm not going to buy shoes without trying them on. I'm not going to buy a mattress without lying on it first. But I got to tell you, going to the mattress store and lying on a mattress for five minutes is no way to choose a mattress. And Casper recognizes this, that there's going to be an issue. People want to lie on it. So here's what they do. They give you 100 nights. You try this mattress for like more than three months. And if at any time in the first 100 nights you go, nope, not for me, you call them up, they come, they take it and refund you every penny. There's no risk, no cost to you. And no trouble. Now, the nice thing about the Casper, and this is why they have to come take it, is when it comes, it comes like, <laughs> they must have a special machine that's all squoozed up in a box. They've got to have a, like a compression machine. Because you open the box, and it's wrapped in Tyvek, and then you, you slit the thing, and it goes, and it just like expands, and you'll never get it back in that box again. That's why they come and get it. They get rid of the box. The mattress comes out of the box smelling great. Now, I don't know about you, but I have bought... Um, uh, mattress, foam mattresses, uh, you know, memory foam mattresses before, they smell like rubber for weeks. I don't know how Casper does it. This is another machine. They must have invented a compressing machine and a deodorizing machine. Maybe it's just like they blow fresh air over it for a while. But it smells great out of the box. It is cool. Now, let me talk about the comfort. Because I would submit what you're looking for with a, with a mattress is both support and give seems contradictory but you want it to to give uh, for your pointy bits so you don't have any you know you don't you don't want your hips to be pressing into something hard you want it to give but at the same time for your back and support you need firm so you want both and you get it with the casper mattress it is so soft so comfortable and yet firm i love a firm mattress and i love my casper free delivery box is so compact i ordered for my son in the dorms at college because that mattress was pretty uh, that the came in the dorm room in fact it is so affordable i said just leave it there after four years he did so, you know you don't need it anymore uh, but he, he was able to get the box up the stairs he lived on the third floor of the dorm easy open it up psh, he's ready to go casper recently introduced a new mattress now i don't want to make things complicated. The original mattress is what I sleep on and is great. They're sending me this new one, the Casper Wave mattress. And I will let you know. And you can read about it at casper.com slash floss. Features a natural geometry support system and a new top layer. It's worth a look. And you know, the same 100-day guarantee, so there's no risk. Free shipping and returns in the U.S., in Canada, I'm happy to say, and now in the U.K., I'm really happy to say. If you go to casper.com slash floss and use the promo code floss, not only will you tell them you love Floss Weekly, and we appreciate the support, but you'll get an additional $50 towards your mattress purchase. 50 bucks off, terms and conditions apply, and you'll be showing your support for Floss Weekly. So go to casper.com slash floss. Give it a try today. We love them, and I, know, I love it, and I know you will too. And now back to the good guys at Floss Weekly. Well, it must be nap time now. <laughs> I do need one. I actually do need one. I need to replace my mattress. I may take Leo up on his offer. That's very, very nice. Uh, well, this is this show isn't about sleeping. This show is about really cool software, which today is no exception. So let's go ahead and bring on our guest. First, let's bring on Dan Wood. Welcome to the show. And all great to be joining you. Awesome. And where are you speaking to us from? Uh, from the UK at the moment, and uh, there'll be no napping here. I'm uh, on my second coffee, so okay, it'll be nice and lively. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And let's also bring on, uh, I'm going to mispronounce it again, Hogni Tiltestad? Actually, uh, Dan Wood did a great job uh, pronouncing my name. It's Hogne Tiltestad in, in, in Norwegian, and he should uh, perhaps give his take afterwards. I'm in from Hogne. Uh, Norway. Hogne. Closer? Hogne. <laughs> Hugging the, oh no! I'm, okay, yeah. Oh man, why why can't everybody's name be an ASCII? It would be much simpler. <laughs> 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 All right, let's start with Dan. Uh, give us a 30,000-foot view. Uh, uh, what is What problem is this solving? 
Well, I think even though we've reached this stage in technology now where, you know, it's come a long way in the last couple of decades, we've still got this problem insofar as we have iOS phones, Android phones, Linux, Mac, PC. And in terms of developers, they've still got to compile different editions of their program and kind of work around the limitations of, you know, legacy operating systems, really. These OSs were designed to, you know, connect to the Internet as an afterthought, really. It's not something they were built from the ground up to do. So Friend, essentially, I mean, if you want it summed up really simply, um, our goal is to increase access. So that's to help developers get free of the shackles of traditional operating systems and also allow users to use their same applications and access their files on any device, no matter where they are and whatever they're using. Okay. And so you, what you've done is you've essentially rebuilt an operating system in, uh, in not entirely in JavaScript. It's, I mean, what, what's the technology here? What, where, what have you brought it all down to? JavaScript, but we've got a C kernel, um, which obviously gives it a lot of speed. And that was one of the first things that really impressed me about the Friend platform when I saw it. I mean, you know, I, I first came across this product about two years ago when the guys were demoing it in Norway. And I didn't realize just how powerful web technology had got today. I mean, we have applications that run inside the Friend desktop that are made in HTML5 that are, you know, the speed of full proper desktop applications. You, can, you can't tell the difference between them today. Oh, well, uh, Hogna, you want to carry that up forward and talk more about the, the technology? Well, uh, sure. Thank you. Um, so I think it was in 2014, I was sitting in my office and having done a lot of web development since 2001, I noticed that the technologies had gone to a point where there were no limit to what you could do. And uh, be it manipulating a lot of data just inside the browser or uh, streaming data from a server. But I realized that uh, the web platforms that are, uh, were available were uh, web applications based on, on complicated stacks uh, in the server space. And so um, what we have done is that we've taken the idea of a traditional operating system and broken it up into components, some which can reside uh, on the internet in, in, you know, in what you'd call the cloud or in server space. And then the other ones that can run on your machine using the technologies that we have today. So uh, it's not exactly a desktop operating system because you don't actually have to use the desktop at all. You can use the, the, the framework that uh, allows this technology to work just to distribute your application onto the internet. And uh, so the first phase of this product is to show people that it can be done and that they can actually have their entire workflow uh, in the cloud, in their browser tab, or on their phone or, or other devices. But in the future, it's also a deployment strategy to give people easy access to applications and give developers um, an easy way to distribute their applications to multiple target platforms. Okay, and so what I understand that I'm basically uh, developing stuff in yet another language then, if I want to build applications, uh, but is there already a way to use existing applications? Oh, uh, we're not going for uh, changing the programming languages at all. Uh, actually, uh, what we're doing quite a little bit of work on is to make sure that we support all the existing languages that are out there and the existing APIs as well. So you have to see Friend as a, a manager of Windows, um, Windows flowing on your screen coming from different technologies. So we're managing Windows applications, we're managing different types of web applications and letting you run them without having to install anything. Uh, also without having to necessarily log into anything because the system uh, takes care of the, the, the login um, uh, routines. And so, so um, it, it's not to change what people are doing today, but it's giving people a channel where they can access users and where users can access applications from a wealth of different sources. And, and okay, so, but clearly it, uh, JavaScript and HTML can't run Microsoft Word. Uh, is that running somewhere else then? So we call our, our um, a core server, which is written in C, uh, we call it a type of protocol transcoder. So it takes in different data streams coming, for example, in remote desktop protocol or different protocols. Uh, and then we reroute those uh, to the browser. 
and we, we convert the different protocols. For example, the Windows Remote Desktop uh, protocol, the RDP protocol, we convert that into a series of living um, uh, ping images or JPEG images, if you will. And what you're actually just seeing is you're seeing um, a, a real-time video stream with no buffering, meaning that it's uh, from millisecond to milliseconds and not buffering, for example, like a YouTube video would. So you get uh, a close to real-time operation uh, for your Windows applications, and we're working on, on supporting other uh, protocols as well. And when you run these next to uh, web applications, you kind of get spoiled with the speed because uh, it's not like any kind of remote desktop solution that is out there today. It's a hybrid, uh, and um, that's something that gets very powerful really quickly. Okay, and uh, for people who are listening to this on audio, we're actually looking at a running instance of Friend uh, on a browser. Uh, can uh, so so if you might want to go back if you're an audio only person, go back and actually watch the video for this because I think we're going to be talking a little bit about what we're seeing on the screen. So we're seeing various. It, it looks like a desktop. It looks like you have windows and you have icons in the corner that can make it max size, things like that. Um, Probably more familiar to people who come from a Windows background than a Mac background. I found when I was playing with this, the icons were very confusing to me. Uh, so do you need a Windows background to be able to understand this? No. So uh, there are various different themes. We do also have uh, Windows themes. Actually, if you click on the desktop, you can go into uh, the tools and look and feel, and then you can change it to something that looks a little bit more like a, a Windows um, system. Now, it's very important to, to um, uh, stress. So if we, uh, take this one, you can go to the Fenster X, for example, which is a, a Windows-y uh, style um, look and feel. Now, um, uh, this is version 1.0.0. So it's the first public release that we feel is close to production ready. Um, and um, it does ha uh, have a little bit of a developer feel over it. Now, we are customizing it a little bit for, for um, companies uh, which have preferences in how it should look. So as you can see right now, it would look like something, a mix between Windows, Apple, and, and Linux systems today. So it has a little bit of every, um, you know, every developer we have in the team in it. Now, uh, going forward, it's going to be much more than this. This is just the start. So we've been developing this for three years. It has a lot of features, a lot more features than we can, can talk about in this show. Um, uh, but it is the, the beginning, and, um, and uh, it's going to look much more appealing as, as we uh, get more UX work uh, done uh, over the next few weeks and months. So one of the things that... Uh, uh Kind of struck my interest in in friend OS um, or friend friend up. Um, as I said, like I, I first got exposed to it um, watching Dan's uh, YouTube channel um, where he was talking about like uh, all sorts of retro uh, computers, uh, Amiga OS in particular. Um, and I remember him talking about uh, that the, the the inspiration for friend actually came from a lot of the uh, paradigms and. Uh, ideas that were implemented in uh, in Amiga OS. Um, I was wondering if you guys could uh, uh, kind of speak to a bit about that. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, of course, my background uh, since I was a kid was, was with these systems, and uh, it gave me a kind of a unique uh, perspective uh, going off uh, uh, onto the Windows platform later on in life. And having used a system that was much richer uh, for technical users, um, Windows didn't really have the, the kind of freedom that a person who does more than, than click buttons and, and write letters uh, need from a system. So the Amiga system was never really uh, took off um, as an end user system. The Amiga system, of course, was a games platform. But for power users, uh, people could hardly part with it. And uh, so there was one project uh, back in, I think it was 1994 or 95, uh, that attempted to recreate the entire operating system in open source, seeing that Commodore was going, uh, going down. And I joined that team uh, in the early 2000s. 
uh, working on a desktop environment and then actually um, becoming less afraid of working on an operating system, learning how it's all strung together. Um, uh, that uh, system had a lot of amazing capabilities that would easily translate to how the internet works today. It had multiple mount points for, for uh, disk media. It had uh, uh, application to application scripting, sending messages between the different applications. So it allowed, allowed a lot of power that you uh, kind of have great use for today on the internet. And after unveiling our prototype, we, we went on a little world tour and I actually spoke with a lot of the original designers over in, in Silicon Valley and, and elsewhere uh, who had been working on the ideas and, and, and developing actually the, the, the software for the uh, Amiga computer. And, uh, you know, of course, there was no surprise. Uh, they had uh, in their imagination uh, a lot of um, uh, what we're doing right now seeing how the internet one day would become um, you know, a, a standard thing that everybody would have available who had a computer. And um, so in many ways, part of the project is fulfilling some of that promise, even though, of course, we, uh, the friend project is very much our own. So uh, just switching over to Dan real quick, um, as I said, like uh, my, my first exposure to this was through your YouTube channel. Um, and I remember you speaking uh, very passionately about about this and what drew you into it. Um, and I was curious. Um, uh, There's a great history of it from from Hogney, but I was curious about your uh, what what initially drew you to uh, Friend. Like what what got you excited about it? Well, I first encountered Friend at the um, Amiga's 30th anniversary show that was held in Amsterdam a couple of years ago. And uh, the guys were quite early on then um, in their terms of development status, but they were there demonstrating Friend. And again, I mean, like Hogner kind of touched upon, um, the Amiga, although it wasn't a big platform around the world, it did have a very big following. And I was a fan of the Amiga back then. And we, we kind of didn't like Windows machines and Apple. It was kind of a, a quite a little cult following the Amiga had. And then when I saw Friend demonstrated, what I saw in there were a lot of the best ideas from the Amiga platform. For example, the, the command line in Friend is based on a system called Tripos um, that originated at Cambridge University back in the 70s. And that was implemented in uh, the Amiga um, disk operating system. And also you'll find things like screen dragging that was um, you know a feature that many Amiga users loved. That's implemented into Friend as well and concepts like the mount list and DOS drivers. So as an Amiga user, I did feel instantly at home in the Friend environment. Do you consider this, I mean, this is a question for, for either you or, or Hogney, mm -hmm. um, do you consider this a, uh, a kind of a re, reintroducing of, of uh, the Amiga OS or do you consider it something new? Or, and, and do you see it appealing to, um, designed in a way to appeal to uh, people that, that had an Amiga or used an Amiga um, back in the day, kind of like a, as a nostalgic um, reintroduction to it? I think um, uh, I would dare answer that question a little bit um, um, without being being too pompous. Uh, I think uh, as the next platform related to Mac OS, Friend, I guess, relates to the Amiga OS. Only that uh, what Steve Jobs did that uh, he he. Since he didn't have the, the company, the old company around him, he was free to innovate. And he did some really amazing things with web objects. And, and he was thinking about the future of the internet and all that stuff. And uh, so kind of what he did with, uh, you know, System 7 and, 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 or, or the older uh, versions of Mac OS and taking some of those, those ideas and, and breaking the format and, and going further, I think we're doing a similar thing uh, with the Amiga OS. So in that way, uh, we could be considered in the family of, of our tradition of, of um, a way of thinking, but, but we're going much further than that. We have so many creative people in, in the organization um, uh, contributing to making this thing innovative. And of course, the world is completely different than it was back in the 90s and 80s. So, so in many ways, I also have to stress that having been working uh, since the late 90s uh, with Linux systems, also looking at all the innovative desktop environments and concepts they've been working on, all of that is also present in Friend. 
So, and, and this is perhaps some of the most difficult thing with friend to understand is there's so much to friend other than what you see with the icons and windows. There's a huge um, a system behind there in the cloud uh, allowing you to run things. Even when you close down your browser, it can still run out there on the internet. And uh, so we're doing a lot of things that you just couldn't do with these systems um, decades ago. But of course, there are things shining through. And I think a lot of the people who use those systems are going to love that. But for the rest of the people who never use that, I think they're going to find a lot of things uh, that's going to make them excited as well. That's actually a really good segue into one of the questions from our chat room. Um, do you see any barriers to entry uh, for people that had never used an Amiga and may not know about it? I mean, you guys mentioned uh, the screen, um, the screen dragging, which was a uh, quite an innovative feature um, and one of the, the things that like a lot of people who use an Amiga back in the day really remember as like one of the most powerful features. Um, but for someone who never used one, do you see any uh, any barriers to entry or any difficulties that they might have in using Friend? Yeah, um, it's good of you to say that because uh, it gives me an opportunity to talk about uh, FUI. Uh, FUI in, in, uh, in the tradition of, of uh, user interfaces, uh, the friend user interface, uh, which we're building right now, has a lot of exciting um, opportunities for developers and users as well. And, and um, uh, it does something with what we have done already. For example, take uh, screen dragging. Now, uh, screen dragging is really just a way to manage um, uh, windows that are stacked on top of each other. Now, how Linux um, uh, manages these uh, stacks of, of, uh, of, or you could call it uh, layers, is that it makes um, a, a list of, of workspaces that you can click on. So you can have a horizontal or a vertical virtual screens uh, that form a grid, and then you you can assign keyboard shortcuts to them or click on uh, or click on this grid. I'm sorry. And, uh, and what will actually happen is that uh, you will switch using the grid instead of doing the screen dragging. So, so actually, the UI is, is perfectly configurable, uh, and you don't have to, to, to see these old concepts if you're from a different perspective. And that's the whole point with Friend, is that you can change the interface to whatever you feel like. Oh, so you can make it look like, like if you were a, a Windows user, for example, you could make it look... Uh, similar to one of the later versions of, of Windows, <laughs> if you if you would, uh, and and uh, we happen to know that uh, a great wealth of of uh, Windows users would like Windows never to move away from the Windows Seven paradigm, and and for sure uh, we're going to have um, both a, a Mac like and a Windows like user interface for most users. So um, uh, at the moment in version one oh oh. Uh, you have to kind of get in there and, and, and choose yourself what you want it to look like after having logged in. Uh, in a future update, you're going to log in for the first time and choose what experience do you want. Do you want a Mac-like experience or do you want the Windows-like experience or you want to go crazy and try the friend experience? That's interesting. Um, so one of the other questions uh, that we had from the chat room uh, was, so uh, the the demo that we had uh, that we were showing um, briefly uh, had everything running in uh, presumably uh, the friends, the official friend servers. Um, do you currently now or, or will this be like a future um, option available uh, if someone wanted to use it but host their own server like in, in their own Amazon instance or even like locally on their own uh, internal servers? Well, uh, we just released a white paper that goes into that. And um, uh, we are, of course, very much involved with blockchain technologies and, and this whole new paradigm of decentralized computing. And uh, it was the idea since the very start, since 2014, uh, at the time when Ethereum uh, was unveiled to the world, uh, we had a lot of similar ideas. And um, uh, so actually what uh, we are building now, which is something that won't be immediately available, but, but soon uh, users are going to be able to test it out, is that not only are you going to be able to download and install it, you can go to GitHub today, 
but for enabling a node network uh, technology between all the different uh, servers. So if you're running a friend server, you can connect up into the node uh, network, network and, and offer applications and services and, 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 and resources. And there will be some kind of um, way that people can actually also interface with cryptocurrencies. So the idea of friend in the grand finale is that it becomes part of the internet. Uh, just like you have various BitTorrent networks out there today, uh, we want the friend operating environment to be decentralized and, and kind of embedded into the internet. So no matter which country you're in in the world, as long as you can jack into the internet, you can jack into your friend desktop. And you don't actually have to know who is hosting the operating system because through encryption and other security mechanisms, we're going to make sure that your private data remains private. So for us, this is an exciting thing. And, and we've just started working with, with other uh, blockchain organizations to, to learn from them and, and, and help them as well. So uh, in the future, Friend is decentralized. Anybody can participate. Everybody can become a node. And it's going to be much more interesting for people to roll out their solutions into the decentralized cloud that will be offered through Friend. Well, I'm sure you've probably thought about this already, but the issue there would then be things of identity and authorization and, you know, allocating resources and stuff. Uh, you're opening up an interesting can of worms. I'm sure you've thought ahead about all that stuff. Can you address a, a few of those issues? Sure. Uh, so uh, this is like a, a huge science project. In many ways, uh, we're thinking about it a little bit like... Uh, uh, um, a secret program that not everybody knows they're in on uh, participating in. Um, but of course, um, um, it's something that's being done all over the world at the moment. Everybody, just like in the AI field, is building the decentralized uh, infrastructures, which actually is not necessarily bad for the people who are using centralized clusters. They will also be part of, the, uh, of this, a big part. Um, but there are going to be many, many different ways to authenticate. And in the system that we're building, which is a system of choice, uh, you're going to be able to trust your gut feeling when you're choosing uh, who uh, will, will make sure that you're protected and safe. So there will be a market for people to, to uh, give you the, the security that you need. Of course, we're going to offer one uh, you know, with the solution. But uh, just like you have drivers, you're going to have... Uh, authentication and security drivers that you can plug into the network. And that way, um, you're going to be able to upgrade or migrate if you find out that one solution might not be as good as you want it to be. So let's talk about the uh, 1.0 release that you apparently just recently made. So what, what can I play with already? And do I need to install both the so – well, do, do I need to install the server on my machine or can I go somewhere – and use a hosted solution for now? So right now, um, of course, a decentralized uh, cloud is, is uh, not yet available. Uh, but you should go and read our white paper, and you're going to get a much better view. You, you go to friend, uh, friendup.cloud, and, and there's a link there. Now, today, you can just go and sign up for a free demo account. And with a demo account, you get some storage space. You get access to installing applications there. And also, every two weeks or so, we upgrade the service with the latest version that's running stably. Um, you can download the system on GitHub. And you can um, uh, compile it. And you can even participate with source code contributions. We already gotten several contributions from, from across the world. So you can enter as a developer or a tinker or a, a plain user. And we're going to make it even more simple uh, in the near future. We are preparing packages that you can download and install, binary packages for Linux. And we're preparing um, an installer for Windows computers. And we're preparing virtual machine images so that you can download a gigabyte and then you have a fully usable system that you can play with however you want. I've been listening in that sentence for the word Docker. Are you planning on having a Docker image as well? Oh, for sure. Actually, we already have a Docker image. But what we found is that um, uh, Docker is somewhere in between a virtual machine image and a compile uh, project. <laughs> 
because in that in that it does it, it might not be as heavy as a, a virtual machine, but it's certainly sometimes harder to set up, uh, and um, and so uh, you know for the wealth of users out there, there is a Docker image available, but for the average user, I think uh, if they want to tinker it, uh, uh, with it on their own computer, they should get the virtual machine image. That's you know just uh, a couple of minutes and you're you're up and running. Keep in mind there is um, a desktop component to this and, and uh, all kinds of other uh, connections out through the internet. Right. And what would I see in this? I mean, we did a demo a little bit earlier, but can you describe the current set of applications that are available in the current release? So in the current release, uh, uh, there is available an integrated development environment. Of course, there's a shell, so you can do debugging and, and dig into the system a little bit if you're a developer. There are also quite a few games that has been kind of ported over. We say ported, uh, rather, since this thing is operating on the internet, a lot of these uh, are, are just uh, projected from, from elsewhere on the internet. And of course, there are um, a lot of demo applications. Now, in addition to this, we have one fantastic application that we're using every day ourselves, and that is FriendChat. And FriendChat is something that you should consider using instead of Skype, perhaps in a couple of months, <laughs> which will be able okay. to give you the exact same features. So it's uh, it's it's not only a video conferencing and chatting application that can access Slack and IRC and other things, um, but it also uh, will allow you to script and customize how the video conferencing experience should be. So do you want to use multiple cameras per user? Do you want to use? Uh, do you want to adjust the brightness and contrast of, of the different participants and so on? Put on spe uh, specific titles or, or graphics. So that's our cloud studio uh, version of, of FriendChat. And already today, you can you can use some of those features. And and we have opened up the source code, so you can actually tinker with it and and, and set it up yourself today. And I did notice also that you uh, you talked about integrating IRC and, and uh, Slack and things like that. I did notice also that in your uh, mounting of drives, you could mount a Google Drive or a Dropbox Drive. Uh, I presume there are others um, like that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, in, in uh, Unix, everything is a file, right? Everything's a right. file. Friend, everything is a disk. So. Uh, we've gone one step further, uh, and, and there is a program out there called Fuse who does work with virtual file systems. A uh, friend has a very uh, powerful way to create virtual uh, disk drivers. And we do have one for Google Drive. We do have one from, for Dropbox. And then you can drag and drop. You can take backup of your files or, or, or different things. But moreover, um, we also make uh, drivers out of applications, like, for example, WordPress. We've abstracted WordPress as a drive, uh, disk driver. So you can mount your WordPress um, uh, site as a disk, and you can go in and find your posts and find products and find your images. Uh, and and uh, you know, as time goes by, uh, that's something you're going to see that all the major uh, web applications and systems out there are going to be pluggable as disk drives, and uh, you know that that's just an amazing thing for developers. But it's also pretty cool as it will allow you to back up your products on your web shop and put them on your Google Drive and put them back again and so on. Well, now that raises a bit of concern for me because obviously my my Chrome browser is not talking directly to Google Drive on my laptop. It must be that I'm passing the credentials up to a server, which then does the logging in on my behalf. Um, that means you probably have a username and password stored in the clear over on the server, or am I mistaken? Uh, you're actually mistaken. Uh, uh, oh, good. <laughs> probably you're going to be happy about that. So uh, for the Google Drive, we actually have a virtual executable because all our disk mediums can have virtual executables. And so the first time when you mount the Google Drive, uh, you have to double click the login executable, which will pop up a little window and use Google's own authentication mechanism. Now. Uh, it's not always the case that you want that. Uh, it could be many reasons. It could be you're running the infrastructure and you want to do this server side. So we're going to make uh, the option of you uh, being able to choose that. Uh, but uh, you know, like I said, security is a, a very um, important topic, and um, giving choice there is important. But m making sure that you're not compromised is even more important. 
Okay, and you meant, let's talk more about the server-side technology. You mentioned C. Are there other languages as well? Yeah, we're using PHP and we're using a little bit of uh, Python and Node. Now, Node is a fantastic programming language. And uh, of course, it's JavaScript, but it has some peculiarities. And uh, it's very powerful of, uh, to make server technologies. <clears throat> so we do use quite a little bit of, of Node in our, in our system. And uh, Frenchat has its own Node-based server uh, that's running as well. So, um, uh, but, but the main part of, of uh, the friend kernel, if you want, is uh, written in plain C, not only to be portable, but to give us uh, as fast response times as possible. Uh, we're aiming to have 5G compliance so that you have two to five millisecond uh, round trips uh, on Li-Fi networks or, or 5G networks uh, for most of the system calls in the system so that you can make applications that respond really fast on real-time uh, data and so on. So I had a couple more, a couple questions uh, for Dan, um, just about the, uh, the the general friend community, um, how it is right now, where you see it going, um, just any any insights you have into uh, just any directions it's going in. Well, obviously, we're the you know friend kind of having an Amiga legacy, you could say. Um, originally, we did start in the Amiga community, but obviously, it's grown a lot beyond that in the last couple of years. They were kind of of our initial fans who um, got involved in the project early on. Um, at this stage, though, I mean, we actually do a weekly uh, podcast that we started about five weeks ago now. Um, and I think, you know, it's one of the great things about working with a talented small team that we've got at the moment. Um, the fact that, you know, we can suggest ideas to them and also they will kind of find a way that this technology can help us. Again, getting back to what I said before about, you know, access to making things easier. And at the moment, the guys are working on um, an integration with French app our competence software, which is going to make essentially doing this kind of show really easy. So if you want to do your own video podcast, your own audio podcast, it'll kind of take away the need to have like capture cards and kind of expensive hardware that, you know, it's still a bit of a barrier for a lot of people having to get videos recorded, edited. So in terms of community, I mean, we do try to keep our community updated weekly by doing our own video podcast, which you can find on YouTube or uh, on iTunes now as well. And we also send out weekly newsletters too. So we're kind of getting to the stage now where we're seeing people are actually jumping on board and actually, you know, discovering what Friends are all about and getting more excited about it day by day. What has the, um, one of the things you just said uh, kind of, Maybe think of a, a question. Um, but I'm just curious what the the general reaction has been from uh, some of the, the the general Amiga community um, about friends. Like, what's their their initial impressions and uh, kind of the ideas of of where you guys are going with it. Well, I mean, if you're talking about the Amiga community, which even though it's a system that, you know, hasn't been made for 20 years, there is still quite a, an active community. I mean, if you look on the, the Facebook groups, there's about, you know, a quarter of a million people in like the main Commodore Amiga group. And you kind of get two camps, the ones that you should just play like, you know, video games like Lemmings and that kind of thing. All the more, you know, power users are people who used to mod their machines, maybe did like video production, uh, maybe got involved in programming and, you know, people that were on the internet doing communications and that kind of thing. So I think for those people, they found it a really interesting project, the people that are maybe a little bit more forward thinking. Uh, and they've also kind of seen that it is, you know, a bit of an ode to the Amiga in a few ways, you know, those kind of technologies that they, they may recognize from back then and these ways of doing things. So I think those people have been really excited about it. But also, I mean, we do have some former Amiga developers who are working on the platform now. For example, Francois Lionette, who people may know from Amos and Stos, the uh, programming languages back in the uh, the Atari ST and the Amiga. And we have uh, a few people that used to be involved in the um, Amiga, you know, Commodore itself, who are now really interested in this project and working alongside us day by day. Uh, so one of the, the early questions that Randall um, was asking when we, when we first got started uh, was about uh, running existing applications. Um, and so it kind of like piqued my interest in, in terms of like this discussion, this is Amiga related discussion. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of uh, there's been a lot of interest recently of, of emulating uh, various like older operating systems, particularly uh, Amiga OS. Um, is that mm -hmm. like anything that you guys see uh, possibly supporting in the future, being able to play uh, some of the old Amiga games inside Friend? Now, it's, well, I mean, obviously, not, like, oh, sorry, Hogan. 
<laughs> it's it's not really only Amiga systems. I mean, uh, uh, as an operating environment that tries to achieve a full experience, people are going to be able to do whatever they want. And uh, we are some of the customers we're working with right now. Now are in the medical industry, and uh, they want to be able to treat friend like a real uh, operating environment where they can <coughs> plug in USB devices and all that stuff. So we're we're actually using the browser as a virtual machine, more like a, a browser tab uh, anyway. And we're doing connectivity to hardware devices as, as those uh, boundaries are, are opened up. Uh, Google version, I think it was 60 or 61, has finally opened up with, with um, USB uh, devices. And then you have uh, web assemblies, which recently uh, went out of experimental mode which allows you to get near machine code speed uh, inside the browser. And there you can uh, port any type of uh, programming language to run. And people are making demos and really great um, um, applications and games and even emulators. So for sure, you're going to be able to integrate with any technology, even emulated technology in the friend workspace. And uh, we're going to see that happen sooner rather than later because some people are already working with those things um, at the moment. You know, one of the things that I found interesting is that there are now technologies that allow you to take just a C program and turn it into pure modern JavaScript, not even waiting for the whole uh, WebAssembly stuff to happen. Uh, I was just playing the other day with GraphViz in a browser, totally in the browser, which was like amazing. I would type the uh, changes and I would immediately see the, the picture change. And it's like the best way to actually do, you know, dot and, uh, and neato uh, sort of applications. So, um, but uh, so, so yeah, the, the, definitely the browsers are getting smarter and clearly uh, cross-porting some of the old Amiga games that they actually run directly in the browser. I think there's actually projects that already do that. Um, but yeah, um, uh, cool. We're almost out of time, so I want to make sure we get to a couple of very important questions. Where do you see this going in a year or so? Um, if I may, I think uh, the decentralized aspect of the technology is going to be um, a big, huge thing. And that's what we're working on at the moment, because uh, there are a lot of things that's happening in the world right now that's moving at least my generation, but 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 also all the other generations into thinking. Perhaps it's not such such a good idea to uh, put all your eggs in one basket when it comes to technology. And um, uh, we're actually um, probably soon gonna look into doing an ICO as well. Uh, we've written a white paper that's broadly. Uh, uh, talking to, to the blockchain community and building a decentralized cloud infrastructure that will include IBMs and, and Microsoft, but also individual people and making friend really belong to its users. That's something we're working on. Now, you're going to be able to use your own Windows applications wherever you want to go. You're going to be able to use your Apple uh, systems wherever you want to go. You're going to be able to use web applications from all over the world, but you're not going to be bound to, to your PC or your phone anymore. You're going to know that your, your computer is off or on as you decide on the internet all the time. And it's going to be your agent out there working for you. And uh, so in one year from now, you're going to have friend terminals all over the place. And you're going to be able to access so much computing power that you're going to be uh, wondering what you're going to use it all for. And a very, very important question here, because uh, we haven't even addressed this issue, is what's your business model? How is this all going to be funded? So Friend is very much business oriented. Even though we have a huge focus on technology, which I'm very lucky to have been able to do while t talking to investors and so on. And, and uh, so far, we have raised about two and a half million dollars uh, building this technology, but that also includes a great business development team and a lot of great partners. So at the moment, obviously, the Windows integration space and, and cloudifying Windows applications is really hot. And um, a lot of uh, companies, especially software companies, have applications they might have been using since the 90s, and they just don't have a cloud strategy. So we're working with several companies 
making sure that their users can access their software on modern computers without having to download um, drivers and, and, and install software. So we're really in that space and also heavily into integrating so that people have all databases, can make new web applications through Friend and, uh, and uh, renew those and, and extend their life uh, span into the future. So the money flow is coming from the uh, software developers, software providers, and not from the user base towards you then? Exactly. Uh, this this um, technology would never have been able to, to be developed if our primary target in the first phase of the project was to go after end users. Because uh, they, of course, uh, cannot live with a system that doesn't have the features they need. And uh, businesses are much more narrow when it comes to what functions they need in their solutions. So it's been much easier to go with, uh, with organizations that can help us make the technology scale. I mean, keep in mind, if, if, if Friend would launch uh, to the world at large, you'd get perhaps 100,000 users within the span of a few weeks. An untested infrastructure would just collapse. So having worked with a lot of different uh, commercial entities over the last two years or so has allowed us to uh, spend the time in, in planning and engineering how we scale the system. And within the next few months, we're going to do some really major tests towards end users. And definitely, perhaps in a year, perhaps in one and a half year, uh, we're going to be ready for, for uh, users at, uh, you know, all over the world. And so is your, uh, are you planning on a freemium model or a hosting or a consulting model to get money flowing in that direction as well? So we know that a lot of people, uh, they don't want to download it, even if it's possible. <laughs> and um, uh, they're not necessarily a big company who wants uh, an enterprise solution. So um, uh, FriendSky, uh, which is uh, currently where our demo uh, or, or beta server is, if you will, uh, rolling with people signing up to test it out, is uh, soon going to be bleed into um, um, a, a fully usable uh, cloud solution where people can actually get more storage space and, and, and better applications and access to Windows applications as well. So we are working on, on um, modifying Friend a little bit so it's easier for new users to come in. Also, as we talked earlier about having an Apple-like feel and a Windows uh, theme available from the get-go. So people are going to be able to take their account and, and actually take it quite far and even use it in their business or, or professional life. Okay. And uh, what kind of uh, – now is your chance to do a call for action. What kind of people – are you missing the most in making contributions to move this project forward? Of course, we need uh, developers. And um, I think we've gone through the skepticism period uh, of the last three years. People see we're still here. They're seeing we're delivering. We're putting our code up there. We're making documentation. We need more developers to come in. And it's not only for people who are interested in operating systems or weird things like that. It's for people who are interested in trying out new technologies, which are going to allow them to um, massively distribute their solutions uh, in the very near future. Working with Francois, who has a great experience, for example, in game, uh, game de uh, development, has allowed us to have the discussion of how to uh, help game developers use Friend. And um, uh, it's not only game developers, people who are into making collaborative solutions like groupware or other applications, they should definitely check out Friend because you're going to be able to make use of the Friend chat technologies and also massive uh, networking uh, technologies that we have in Friend to accelerate um, development to get your um, systems built. So major focus on developers at the moment and, of course, um, uh, we need testers, people who would like to do something more than just see if an application fails, but perhaps report a bug or perhaps stick around and have a conversation with us. That would be amazing. Awesome. Awesome. Is your uh, bug tracker part of GitHub? Uh, actually, we're using the one in GitHub. So just submit there and, and we're going to answer and check it out right away. We also have um, uh, our own obviously um, a bug tracker inside the company that uh, we pay for. So um, we do have both, but 
getting through GitHub is perfectly fine. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, and like I said, we're almost out of time. Is there anything we didn't ask that you want to make sure our audience is aware of before we have to let you go? Well, uh, I think we covered most of it. But um, uh, of course, um, uh, one thing that could be interesting to, to discuss is um, what is the future of the internet? Is it TCP IP? Is it www? We're still, uh, we're already using other things than .com. We're using .tv, we're using .video. You have stuff like uh, dtube.video that's heavily um, challenging for uh, YouTube in the future. We are, we're seeing disruptions. The internet itself is changing and, and friend is pretty much part of that. And, uh, and people need to see the technology as part of the change that's happening on the internet right now. Well, I, that sounds like it's a whole nother show, so we don't have that much time. <laughs> but uh, you know what? I think we'll we'll invite you back in about a year or so, and we'll see how, where this has gone and if uh, some of your vision is uh, actually manifest in a, in a way that was uh, you would imagine. Um, so I have two final questions that I have to ask everybody. So these two questions are, what's your favorite scripting language and what text editor do you, do you use all day? So we'll start first with Dan. Oh, well, scripting language. I'm not much of a coder. I mean, that would be one for Hogner. But in terms of text editors, um, yeah, I've always been more of a, even using Emacs just for like, you know, typing documents and that kind of thing. Because I've used it for so long. Yay! Yay! <laughs> yay! Um, yeah. Emacs! Oh, yay! Hey, <laughs> got one. I got one. All right. There's a little bit of me. There's a little bit of me in every copy of Emacs. I want you to know I, I've submitted some code and my name's actually in the credits. It's, I'm actually part of Emacs, so that's why. And uh, how these same questions? Well, I think that that's that's quite uh, funny that he says that because he's using a heavy programmer's editor for his uh, non-code work, <laughs> while I'm using I'm using probably the simplest code editor in the world. The only features that it has uh, as a code uh, editor is syntax highlighting and auto identation. Other than that, it's just a plain editor, and I've always liked that, and 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 that's what I'm doing. My favorite uh, programming language. Is um, is JavaScript, uh, okay. but I'm also very fond of C, uh, and it's just a magical language to me. Cool. And you didn't mention the name of your editor. I bet it's Vim. No, it's uh, this these days. Actually, I'm on the GNOME two train, so I'm using Mate for my Linux environment. And there you wow. have something now that's called Sed or Xed. It used to be called Getit. It was competing with Kedit, and it became uh, Pluma. So now it's just uh, it's an impossible editor to market or, or suggest to anybody <laughs> because they're never going to know what it's going to be called next year. Or it's, it's, it's just called it's, called it's called Star. It's just an asterisk. That's its name. <laughs> <laughs> Try Googling for that. That's going to be a mess. Hey, guys, it's been wonderful chatting with you. I really appreciate the vision and the description of the vision and the current manifestation of the vision uh, is very clear. Well, it's somewhat clear. Clearer now after an hour. But, um, but uh, no, it's, this has been great. Uh, thanks for uh, asking to be on the show and uh, and I wish you the best of luck and like I said maybe we'll bring you back on in a year or two and we'll see where you've gone thanks guys thank you very much thank you been a pleasure cool that was uh, Dan Wood and I'll mispronounce it one last time hockey Tittlestad something like that I'm so sorry I'm so sorry uh, what'd you think there uh, uh, Gareth that's uh, it's really interesting um, I, I think we both had some kind of ideas and some perceptions of, of what it was. Um, and I think we we're mostly right. Um, but it, it's interesting. It was really interesting, like having them fill in the blanks of, of what of, of things we didn't know. Um, and I'm, yeah. I'm personally excited to see uh, where it goes in the future um, and to catch up with them in a year. Absolutely. I definitely want to catch up with them a year or two down the road because uh, obviously uh, great visionaries and uh, really trying to break open a paradigm that, uh, uh, it, you know, it's it's it'll have to find the appropriate scratch to itch, but it's uh, but it or was that backwards? The itch to scratch? One of those. OK, I never remember which is the <laughs> action and which is the thing you're taking care of anyway so uh yeah i'm looking forward to that and uh but uh, like i said we're almost out of time so let me do the quick rundown of who's coming up next week we have oracle open source which uh, is primarily focused these days on uh this particular part of it is docker image management so yet another tool in that space uh i just confirmed with them that they're definitely on 
uh, despite the fact that occasionally I kind of rib Oracle for causing all those forks. But that's okay. They're still coming on next week. Uh, uh, following that, CNCF, uh, the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which I heard a lot about uh, the last couple of days because uh, it's part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, and Packet announced recently that uh, if you're a member of the Cloud, uh, Cloud Native Computing uh, foundation, you get free computer time on packet machines. So that's really, really cool. Uh, Live Git 2, which is the embeddable Git core. Openbenchmarking.org, which is the all things, all, you know, does this Linux machine run faster than that Linux, Linux machine? Does this version of Linux run better, faster than that Linux? Lots and lots of stuff. Uh, not just about Linux, too. It's really cool. Just added to the schedule in the last uh, day and a half. Uh, one of the people actually that I saw here at the at the con, uh, Project Flogo, which is IoT integration for devices. They're building a very nice uh, portable layer to talk to your IoT devices rather than having to run something full like a Node.js instance or whatever that takes a lot more stuff on this. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Bedrock, which is a distributed database built on SQLite. And also, again, just added, uh, just bumped into them at this conference, uh, JFrog Artifactory. So that is a repo manager for binary artifacts. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, Crail rounds out the current schedule. High performance storage and networking. We are talking, again, to like five or six other people that I bumped into at the show here, and they're just now getting back to their people to figure out what dates they can be available. So we'll have probably uh, another bunch of people coming up real soon. Uh, the list for that is twit.tv slash floss, the homepage for this show. If you go there, you'll see the big uh, list uh, as I'm working it. Uh, if you have any other suggestions, please tell the project leader or community coordinator to email me, Merlin at Stonehenge.com. My address is on that page. Uh, we do a live stream at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays, usually. Uh, sorry, it's Thursday today because we got bumped. Uh, that's at live.twit.tv. We take uh, questions from there. We took a number of questions today from the chat room. Uh, you can follow us at Floss Weekly on Google Plus and at Floss Weekly on Twitter. You can follow me at Randall L. Schwartz on Google Plus and uh, at Merlin on Twitter. And uh, like I said, uh, we've been, I found a great time here at the Open Source Summit. I uh, look forward to doing it again next year um, and the year after that and the year after that. Every year they keep inviting me. Um, my, my next conference, by the way, is allthingsopen.org, which is in the uh, Research Triangle, Raleigh, North Carolina. Hopefully that wasn't too messed up from Irma. Uh, probably a little bit of wind swept through there. But uh, anyway, I'll be out there in about a month and a half, two months, and pick up some more guests. Boy, I tell you, we're going to have to have uh, two shows a week for a while. <laughs> oh, that would that would be the kind of problem I would love to have, actually. It's never been that. It's always been, oh, no, it's next week, and I haven't got a guest yet. So, <laughs> Anyway, Gareth, you want to plug anything? Uh, sure, yeah. I will be at the uh, Siegel Conference, uh, which is taking place October 6th through the 7th um, in Seattle, Washington. Um, so I'll be speaking there. I will also be at All Things Open. Um, uh, along with you, Randall, and a bunch of other open source enthusiasts. Um, and then I will be speaking at the uh, Salt Stack uh, conference um, in Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, so that's happening October 31st through November 3rd. Cool. And I would like to also say uh, thanks to the uh, Linux Foundation for inviting me to be here this week. And I, I, it's a really good conference. I tell you, it's a, it's a little cheaper than OSCON, but that's saying nothing. <laughs> I mean, <it's, laughs> that's definitely saying nothing because OSCON is, is the, big, the big player and also the very most expensive open source conference I could probably figure out. Um, but no, it's been, it's been really good. The speakers have been awesome. Um, I, I'm definitely looking forward to coming here again next year if they invite me back. And I didn't speak too bad about them so check that out anyway we gotta go we'll see you all again next week on floss weekly